Thank you all for joining us for the Teaching Logistics, Planning and Managing a Class Workshop. Joining us today are Dr. Caitlin Clinton, Assistant Professor and Director of Composition in the English Department, and uh, Melissa Bowles terry Director of the Faculty Center. They're gonna discuss strategies for um, how to plan for and manage a class. So I'm gonna hand it over to them to go ahead and get us started. Thank you all. All right, hi everyone. It's nice to see some uh, blank boxes on WebEx, which we are very used to at this point. Um, so Melissa and I are happy to be here. Um, we're not sure how many of you have teaching experience. Those of you who may have taught uh, online last year, uh, maybe you even taught in person previously, uh, but it, what we're hoping to do in these uh, two workshops is to uh, refresh those of you who have taught before or to provide some strategies uh, for whatever you might be teaching um, as we return to the classroom for the first time. So today we're going to specifically talk about uh, planning and managing a class and next week we'll talk more about what you can actually do in your class, what sort of activities, what how you can structure your time, as well as how you can assess what students have learned. All right, so Melissa, can you hit the next slide? Uh, so today we'll talk about a few things. We'll talk about how you actually structure your class time. We'll provide some lesson plan uh, suggestions as well as a template for you that you can use in your own class. Uh, then Melissa will talk more about some classroom management, uh, some scenarios that uh, may come up depending on the classes that you teach, uh, as well as some logistical questions. And then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. And so by the end of our workshop today, you'll be able to structure your class meetings and uh, figure out how you manage your classroom time. Uh, you'll be able to create a draft lesson plan from a template. We'll provide the template. You probably won't have time to finish the lesson plan today, but you'll at least be able to get some ideas to get started uh, and then respond to some common classroom management concerns. Okay, so to start off, we're gonna talk about some of the principles about how we plan classes. And the way that we do that is through backward design. Um, and so typically when we think about what we're going to do in class, we think about, oh, I have this really cool reading or this cool activity that I want students to do. And I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna show this you know, movie in my class. Uh, and that's where we start. Um, and that is, uh, maybe the more traditional way of designing classes and our class meetings. Uh, instead, in pedagogical theory, there's this idea of backward design. And there are books written on this, and I'd have included in that folder um, that we have at the bottom, the bit link, teaching logistics. I have included uh, a reading that addresses backward design if you're more interested. But this uh, backward design begins with the principle of what do we want students to learn? And then from there, we create uh, our course curriculum uh, in order to help students meet what we want them to learn. So it's always prioritizing not the cool activity, this cool idea that I have, but instead, what do I want students to learn? So once you have what students, what you want students to learn, then you think about how am I going to know that students have learned what I want them to learn. That's the step two. That's determining acceptable evidence. And then the third step is uh, we plan learning experiences and instruction to help students uh, achieve these learning outcomes. And so that's where we get to uh, come up with these great assignments, these great activities. Uh, we bring in different content ideas uh, because the reason we you know, have class meetings, the reason we provide, you know, students with, you know, homework and assignments and activities and that we meet with them in class is because we want them to learn something. And so this backward design process prioritizes student learning. Melissa, can you? All right, so we're going to start by developing some learning outcomes for your class, which might sound a little bit intimidating and depending on the, the context that you're in, these learning outcomes might already be predetermined for you if you're teaching um, a class with a standard curriculum. But I think we all, based on our discipline and the kind of course that we're teaching, we all have goals for our students. We all have things that we want our students to learn uh, in our class that these different concepts that if they remember nothing else from your class in, in one year, 
in 10 years, what do you want them to remember? So I'm going to give you two minutes and I'd like you to just write down one goal that you have for students in your class. What do you want them to learn? What's the most important thing that students will learn in your class? And you can feel free to share what uh, you want students to, to learn in your class in the chat, uh, or you can keep it to yourself. So for example, I, I teach writing, uh, I'm a writing instructor. And so one of the things that I want my students to learn is that uh, writing is a process. And so that means that writing doesn't just miraculously emerge on a page as we all are painfully aware often. Uh, instead, writing uh, goes through different stages. So that's one goal that I have for students in my English 101 class. But this is a pretty big goal. And some of the goals that I also see in the chat, uh, confidence with communication skills, particularly in public speaking uh, or aseptic technique, uh, these are probably fairly large goals. Um, and they're not very specific at this point uh, because I just asked you to write down a goal. Now we want to take our goals, what we want students to learn and to transform them into learning outcomes. And so for that, we can use Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, a learning outcome is very specific about what we want students to learn. So instead of a, like a broad idea of, I want my students to become better writers, or I want my students to you know, become uh, safe, uh, or I want my students to become scientists, uh, or I want my students to, to question different ideas, uh, we need to break it down into something that is more specific that we would be able to identify like when a student has actually achieved that. So we have in the less or in our folder, Melissa, can you pull up the blooms verbs? Or I can share. We've uh, added for you this uh, Bloom's taxonomy action verbs. And so it often is helpful for us to begin with a verb or an action word. What is it that students will actually be doing? Uh, and Bloom's taxonomy is one way that we uh, kind of categorize the different verbs that students, yeah, I can zoom in, this is our time. It's also available for you in the, uh, the Google folder that uh, Nev also linked in our chat and that Melissa just put there. So we have these multiple categories of action verbs uh, related to learning. Um, and so Bloom's taxonomy, we often think about it as a, a, a pyramid. At the bottom are these fundamental concepts or fundamental actions of things like remembering um, and then understanding, applying moves further up the pyramid to analyzing, evaluating, creating. And so this is how students interact with, with knowledge. Uh, so they have to start off by just understanding, being able to you know, recite, that they uh, regurgitate information, they have things memorized. Once they have that foundational understanding, then they're able to move into these higher level uh, levels of learning. So then they're applying these concepts of, of for example, you know, uh, 
they might be learning about mitochondria, they might be learning about how cells function, uh, and then they memorize that, but then they actually apply it in a lesson to understanding cell functions. And then they start analyzing, they start eventually making their way to creating new knowledge. And so we want to think about how uh, we incorporate all these different levels of learning uh, in, uh, in our classes over a period of time. Um, as I mentioned, like you can't, you know, expect students to understand or to start creating new knowledge as a historian until they understand the history that has already, the, the theories that are already in place. So you can scroll down and you can see the different verbs that are typically associated with these different levels of Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, so you can see that here uh, in these lower levels of the Bloom's taxonomy period, uh, pyramid, uh, we have things like recall, select, tell. Uh, they understand the basic concepts of what, when, where, why, who. Uh, and then they might start classifying. They start uh, breaking down that understanding further. So I would like you to take your goal and to find a verb that fits with your goal for students and to try to rewrite uh, your, your goal for students as a learning outcome. And typically that is structured as students will be able to blank. Students will be able to pick a verb uh, and go from there. So I'll give you a few minutes and you could put your learning outcome in the chat if you'd like. And it's perfectly fine. I mean, you all are the disciplinary experts in your field. Um, so that's why we're not really work, workshopping these together because, uh, you know, it's more important for you to be able to evaluate your own learning outcomes. Uh, aseptic technique means something to, <laughs> to those of you. Uh, doesn't mean as much to me, uh, but the same way that my disciplinary knowledge might not translate in the same way. Okay, so once you have your learning outcome, uh, which the ones that we have in the chat, students will be able to build confidence with public speaking skills. Students will be able to demonstrate aseptic techniques. These are good examples of uh, learning outcomes. Students will be able to identify social policies which lead to socially constructed norms. Yeah, uh, so I want you to now review your goal. And again, this is where you can draw on your disciplinary expertise and it's not necessarily something that uh, Melissa or I will be able to decide uh, for you, but I'd like you to review your goal and decide, is this a goal? What is the scale of this goal? Is this a goal, something that we can achieve in a single class in a you know 50 to 75 minute class period? Is it something that we would uh, be able to achieve, a student would be able to achieve and demonstrate over an entire unit, maybe multiple weeks? Uh, is it something that can be that is an entire course, like that they would learn over 16 weeks? Is it something that we aspire that they learn over an entire career? Melissa, do you want me to start presenting again? Um, I can, I'll go back to the slides. So based on some of the outcomes that we have in our chat, we can, you know, think that students will be able to build, uh, will be able to build confidence with public speaking skills. That's probably a semester long 
school. You know, that's why students take, you know, COM 101. Uh, aseptic technique, uh, again, I'm not an expert in this, but this sounds like something that might be achievable over, you know, a, a unit, you know, that they're learning the different components of aseptic, aseptic technique and then actually applying it using that. Uh, it might even be a lesson. Again, that depends on your disciplinary knowledge. Students will be able to identify social policies, which lead to socially constructed norms. This also seems like a big semester, you know, even maybe potentially multiple semester uh, learning outcome. And that's completely fine. We have all these goals for students at different uh, over different time periods, what we want them to achieve in a 50 to 75 minute class period, uh, and then things that we want them to achieve over our course. Uh, and again, throughout their entire major. But what I'd like you to do now is to modify your goal so that it is appropriate for a single lesson. So that means breaking down these bigger learning outcomes that we have that might take, you know, four weeks, 16 weeks, uh, multiple classes, and to think what can students achieve in a 75 minute class period? So you might need to break your learning outcome down into more specific uh, mini outcomes. So take just a few minutes and try to modify your goal. Yeah, so now in the chat, we have a couple of learning outcomes that are more specific. There's something that students can do in 75 minutes, uh, whether they're, uh, you know, demonstrating the specific aseptic technique, uh, whether they're defining some concepts, uh, they can identify uh, deviant behavior. Okay, so we have a great question in the in the chat about if I teach a one day a week course, would it still be useful to break down the goals into smaller chunks, or should there be one main goal for each class session? What I typically do is I have you know my semester goals, what I want students to achieve over the entire semester, and then I have my unit goals, which are you know smaller versions of those big semester goals. Uh, for a and then for my courses, I have uh, for my individual class meeting. Uh, I might have two or three uh, outcomes for that day, depending on uh, you know how big those outcomes are. So if you're teaching one day a week and you have you know you're spending you know two and a half hours in that class, you you might have multiple outcomes. You might have bigger outcomes. I find that uh, for me it works better to have much smaller outcomes <laughs> uh, to structure my class time. So that I have one activity and here's the outcome for this 30 minute activity. And then I move to the next activity, which we'll get into what we're talking about next, which is how do you turn these outcomes into your class time? Okay. Um, which we'll get to in a, a minute, because I forgot the, the second step, which is uh, determining acceptable evidence. So once you have that, uh, that bite-sized learning outcome, what students would actually be able to achieve in one class meeting with you. Um, then you'll wanna think about how am I going to know that students have actually achieved this? How have they learned what I wanted them to learn? Uh, and there are a couple of ways to do this. Uh, you have your in-class activities. So you might be doing individual activities uh, with your students uh, where they are writing something, whether they are doing uh, you know, an individual lab project or a group lab. Uh, activity, uh, and if students are able to complete that activity, 
you know that they've met the learning outcome. Uh, they wanna be able to uh, complete that activity without having learned what you wanted them to learn. So for example, they won't have created that street plate yielding colony uh, forming units without contamination if they didn't use the aseptic technique, they would have been contaminated. <laughs> you might also have an end of class wrap up. Uh, and so this is a way to uh, have your students reflect on what they've learned and what they still need to know. So the muddiest point is an activity I often do at the end of my classes, which asks students on anonymous index cards to write, you know, what was the most confusing part of the class for them today? What was the most troublesome concept? Uh, what questions do they still have? Or they can write a one minute paper which practices those writing skills. Uh, and it asks them to summarize, what did you learn in class today? You also have uh, homework assignments. Um, let me go back, thank you. Uh, your homework assignments. So uh, if students complete a reading, if students complete an out of class activity, these are always all things that you can tangibly point to and say, yes, students uh, have met this outcome because they have completed this, this work. Um, and so then you also have acceptable evidence that's at the different scale of your class. So you're, you might have major assignments for your units. You might have a, you know, really long, you know, they produce a lab report, they produce a, a research paper, uh, they produce a, a presentation. Um, those aren't things that they're doing within a particular class period. Uh, so these are some of the smaller uh, pieces of evidence that you might have within, you know, one of the 50 to 75 minute classes. Uh, and then I'm going to provide some suggestions for now that you know what you want students to learn, now that you know what you're going to consider acceptable evidence, uh, I'm going to provide some suggestions for learning experiences and instruction or what you do in your class, uh, but also recognizing that we're from a variety of disciplines and the different uh, activities that you use in your class will, will vary. Uh, but in general, uh, the average attention span for a single activity is about 10 to 18 minutes. And this is not something to besmirch students. This is all of our attention spans. Um, so you'll want to think about how you include multiple activities. Um, Melissa, can you progress, please? So if you have a 75 minute uh, class session, you'll want to include multiple activities. If you're teaching a once a week class that is, you know, three hours long, you'll definitely want to include multiple activities. Nobody wants to sit through a three hour lecture. Uh, I know I definitely couldn't. So you often, when we talk about active learning, which we'll talk about more next week, um, lecturing kind of gets a bad reputation. Uh, lecturing itself isn't bad. As we went through with Bloom's taxonomy and that pyramid, students need to understand some fundamental concepts. My lights just went off. <laughs> All right, there we go. I'm not in the dark anymore. Students need to understand some fundamental concepts, and that might uh, they might develop that knowledge through a reading that you assign out of class, uh, or it could be a lecture that you do. But you can uh, include ways to make lecture more active by uh, you know, presenting some content, uh, giving students an opportunity to ask questions or to do a little activity, like what we've been doing uh, through this session, you know, where I gave you some information, asked you to apply it yourself, uh, and then we moved through the lecture together. You should also consider that uh, you know, our students are incredibly diverse and that they are going to learn and interact in different ways. So you'll want to facilitate different types of activities in a class meeting. That means that you might include some individual work. You might inc include some group work. You might uh, include some uh, different activities that really focus on a text. You might include some analysis. Uh, you can go back to those Bloom's taxonomy charts to come up with different verbs uh, so that students are doing activities that fall into the different categories. Uh, you should also think about using di different communication modes in your class. So not all of our students will learn best uh, just through an oral lecture. Uh, some of our students will not process the information that quickly for a variety of reasons. They might uh, 
you know, English might not be their first or even their third language. And so it takes them more time to understand. Uh, I know that I have a very difficult time just listening without also seeing text as well. I just don't process as quickly uh, as other people do. So you can always uh, provide some oral instruction, but then also use something like PowerPoint slides, like what we've been doing here so that uh, students who might read and uh, retain information better uh, can also get that, that same information and have the same ability to access uh, your course which gets into plan for accessibility from the beginning. If you are incorporating different uh, types of activities, um, different ways of your students engaging with the material, more of your students will be able to participate fully in class and get as much out of your class as possible. In general, uh, include plenty of opportunities for practice. So we know that students learn through this process of uh, instruction or you know, gaining that content knowledge, practicing it, applying it, getting some feedback, and then practicing again. That's how we all learn. And so thinking of your class as a way that you can actually structure this, you know, give them some information, um, then give them an opportunity to practice, to apply what they've learned, give them some feedback. It doesn't have to be individual feedback necessarily. It could be, you know, that they're getting feedback from other people in their class they're doing, getting you know, feedback working in a group or that you're having a large group uh, class discussion. It could be feedback that you give to the entire class overall. Uh, and then giving students an opportunity to practice again, whether that's in class or out of class. That's how students will learn best. Uh, and then I know from uh, working with a lot of grad students that there's always a concern about, well, what happens if I run out of material? I have a three hour class with them and we went through everything in 35 minutes. What do I do now? Students can always work on their own projects that they have for your class and you can check in with them individually. So if that means that you're in a lab and they're you know, trying to work on some of their own uh, materials, if they're in a, uh, a math class and you give them time to work on some practice problems, uh, often students will, if you ask if they have any questions at the end of a class meeting or when you're done with all the material, they will say, they won't say anything. Uh, but once they go home and start trying to do the work individually on their own, that's when they discover that they might have questions about an assignment or they run into some challenges. Um, and so if you give them an opportunity in class to get that jump start, then you can address questions as they come up rather than when you get the panicked email at 2.35 in the morning. Uh, and then uh, some of the most important aspects of class time are the transitions. So how do we move from uh, activity to activity, from class to class? So you can also think about class introductions. Uh, when you start the class, how do you start your class in a way that's most effective? Uh, and what we know about students retaining information uh, is that uh, the more that we can build in these transitions and to make it really explicit for our students, the better it is for them. So when you're starting a class, think about what did we do previously? Asking students to recall those previous um, class activities and what they've learned. Uh, and then to give a brief preview about what are we doing today and how does this relate to what we have previously done? So that students are, you know, you can think of it as they have these building blocks. They've got Legos. They're building this knowledge to make something that's more complex. Uh, we don't want students to just have a bunch of blocks in front of them and they're like, what is this supposed to be? That also has to do with our class conclusions. So students will retain the information if we can summarize and reflect. So what did we do today? What did we learn? And then what are we going to be doing in our next class? How are we going to continue to build, develop, or complicate what we've done today. Uh, we have also created for you uh, in our the Google folder, there is a lesson plan template, which Melissa has here. Um, and so this is a uh, pretty detailed lesson plan, uh, but I find it's beneficial to start with something that's more detailed, figure out what works for you and to make adjustments as needed. So there's a lot of just general information about, uh, you know, 
what uh, materials you might need for class. Uh, lesson plans are a good way for you to know what you're actually going to do in that class. <laughs> Uh, the things that you need to bring so that you don't end up in class and realize that you needed handouts that you didn't bring. Uh, so you can, there are teacher materials, student materials, what will students need to bring, uh, what students will have done for the session, uh, the learning outcome. So what will students learn in that particular class meeting? Uh, and then how will you know that students have learned, uh, have met that outcome? And so then it's broken down into learning activities. And so depending on the length of your class, uh, you might have multiple activities. Uh, so the instructors that I teach typically are teaching uh, 75 minute classes. And so I tell them for that, you know, you're probably doing two to three activities in that amount of time. And that third activity is probably one that you isn't as important to you that if you get to it, it's great, but it's not critical just in case uh, students uh, or the previous activities take longer than you think, that there's more class discussion, that there are more questions that come up, or just technology sometimes doesn't work <laughs> and you might not get started uh, at the time that you wanted to. Uh, you might also change the timing depending on, you know, a, a quick little lecture, you know, doesn't probably need to take 30 minutes. That might take five minutes. And so it'll, you'll be able to do more activities in that class. Uh, and then there is also the, the wrap up for class. Um, so what are some of the logistical things that need to happen to wrap up class? You know, telling students what their next assignment is, what they need to do before the next class, if there's an assignment that's due, reminding them of that, uh, but then also just checking in with your students. Did they learn what they needed to learn that day? And we'll talk about some different assessment techniques next week, as well as different ways to actually structure, like what is this learning activity number two that I should be thinking about? We'll talk about that and give you some ideas next week. Okay, so um, we really do encourage you to get into that template. If it seems useful to you, make a copy and, you know, run with it, use it going forward. Hopefully that's useful to you. Um, we're going to spend our next bit of time talking about some classroom management scenarios. Uh, so this is going to be kind of a choose your own adventure part of our workshop today. Um, in the folder that we shared with you, there, there's a guide with some early interventions for students. This has some stuff that you can do in your classroom, of course, to make the, the classroom uh, an inclusive and a good learning space. But then we also have a whole list of offices for referrals because things come up in the classroom when you're dealing with students that are sometimes just way out of your purview, maybe way above your pay grade. So we just want you to know that there are a lot of offices on campus that are here for you for those um, student support issues that just go above and beyond what you can offer as a graduate assistant or even as a faculty member and providing this to faculty members as well, because a lot of this stuff is beyond our realm of expertise. So the first uh, support office that we're giving you is the UNLV support team. This is like the anything. If there's anything at all that you're worried about with the student, if they're not showing up, if they seem like they're not okay, if they tell you they have some um, housing or food insecurity issues, really anything like that, you can refer them to the support team, which is a, what it sounds like, a team of um, professionals on campus who can help students get counseling, can help students get health care, the different kinds of things that are available that students might not know about, and you might not know about, and I might not know about, but um, you can always make referrals to the support team. And then the rest of the offices here are more specific. So if you want to refer students to coaching, advising, tutoring, um, that can happen. There are peer mentors on campus, student outreach specialists. So the rest of this list, I'm not gonna go to in detail, just so you know, there are these resources out there. Um, that you can refer students to, um, but kind of your, your starting point, your go-to for anything where you're like, wait, I don't, I don't know what to do with this student or how to help this student, go to the support team. So I want to put that out there first and then give you some classroom management scenarios. So this is also in your uh, folder and I'd like everybody to open this one up. I'm gonna stop sharing here in a minute. 
Um, but we have eight different possible scenarios. There are, you know, of course, hundreds, but these are some that came to mind for me and Caitlin as we're thinking about what have we faced in the classroom? What have we heard about from our peers, mentees, colleagues um, about things that happen where you're like, now what? Now what do I do? So we're going to give you these eight scenarios. Um, I'd love for you all to just take five minutes, choose the scenario that uh, jumps out for you that you think, oh, this could definitely happen, or I could see this coming to pass, and um, make some notes about how you would respond. And I'd actually love for this to be like a useful document for everyone. So if you don't mind just like making your notes in the document to share with everyone, that would be great. And then you'll have this going forward as well so that you can see what your peers would recommend to you if uh, something like this comes up in your class. So I'm gonna mute myself and set a timer for five minutes and just give you a little time to think about this.
just one more minute and then we'll jump in and discuss here. Okay, well, that looked like a really productive five minutes. I feel like we have great answers to a lot of these scenarios that will um, likely be really useful for you if these things come up. Um, I, I don't even have a whole lot to add. I think your ideas for the, what was the reading again, are fantastic. I have good ideas for what to do if you still have 20 minutes left in class. Um, I will say on the, the get your mask on scenario, you can refer students to student conduct. That's like the, um, that's the official line is if students won't put a mask on, if they won't comply, then you can refer them to student conduct. You can end the class. So you can just send that student to the office of student conduct. Um, but, you know, you want to keep yourself and your classroom safe. So, um, just looking through here. Are there any, were there any that just stumped you where you're like, oh, I, I'd like to discuss any scenarios that you want to take a minute on? One thing that I know that I've had is um, when students just don't show up. Um, Cause I've gotten emails that were like the early intervention and you can say like this student last showed up this day or they're not turning in assignments. Um, and I'm always wondering, like, there's only so much you can do. Like, I can't go to their house. Like, I don't know where they live. Oh. Um, but that one is, has always been, like, the concern. Like, on one hand, I can't, I can't let it eat at me. But I, I do always wonder, like, what happens when a student is just gone? Mm -hmm. You know, and what, what we can try to do. Yeah, I mean, reaching things. out to the support team is, uh, is a good start there. And you can also, um, you know, try advising, like contact your college's advising office and just say, like, I haven't seen or heard from this student. Has anyone in advising heard from them? And they may not have anything to tell you, but that is another, like, point of contact for a lot of students. Do you have anything to add on that one, Caitlin? I would just say that, you know, it, as you were saying, um, you can't let it eat away at you and at some point you have reached the end of what you can do you know it is not your responsibility even if you knew where they lived to show up and knock on their door and you know our students have so much going on in their lives that sometimes uh you know college is not and should not be the number one priority um you know if they're dealing with you know illness or caretaking responsibilities um that those are legitimate things that happen um, and we can't know everything that's going on in their lives. So, you know, I tell uh, my GTAs that, you know, send an email to your students, whether or not they respond, uh, you know, you can check in at various points um, using the early alert. If you're teaching a general ed, typically like a 100 or 200 uh, level class, like that is an email that you will, you will get and, you know, fill that out. The support team is great for every single class, uh, so definitely use that. But then also kind of give yourself the grace to, you know, try not to let it bug you, that you know that you have done everything that you can that is within your responsibility um, at that time. Yeah, I think that's because I don't, it's not coming from a place, because I hear what you're saying of like, it's not always their priority, right? Like school sometimes just has to go. Um, but it's just being able to say like, Hey, if it's mental health, there's caps, like y'all pay for this. Do you know, it exists like, 
um, the food pantry. And I love this list because I actually have been trying since I became an instructor um, to actually provide these support links on my Canvas site and show students the first day. And there are things on here that I haven't added. <laughs> so I, I do like that there are other things that I didn't know about in order to tell my students now, you know, at the beginning of the semester. Yeah, and I gave all of our instructors, like I created a one page document that's a list of uh, resources for our students. So, I mean, they're for people who are teaching writing classes. So there are some things that, uh, you know, it doesn't include every single resource on campus, but there are some that are, you know, discipline specific, like, hey, if you need help with writing, go to the writing center. But then there are also general things like CAPS or like uh, there's an emergency fund for students who have financial uh, difficulties. Uh, and so I'll also put that uh, document up in our Google Drive uh, in the folder. That way you have access to it and know that, you know, the language is a little more friendly for students. Uh, and so you can adapt it as you want to. Great. Um, any other scenario here that you would like to discuss a little more? Anything else um, you want more info on in the scenario? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, what was the name of the scenario? The eager beaver scenario. I know I am dealing with that one right now. I have a class that I just met with for the first time yesterday and there were some complications. So we didn't meet on Tuesday and I had one student who showed up to class very much prepared, very much, uh, eager to be in the course and was kind of participating and, uh, to an extent, maybe even over participating and then every other student kind of just was backed up and was giving that student like, yeah, if you want to talk, keep talking. And I was unsure how to, you know, politely kind of point out, like, I love your enthusiasm and I'm so glad that you are wanting to participate, but I also need to encourage other students to be a part of this and to participate. Um, and, you know, how to do that <laughs> kind of politely to the student who is eager, but also to make the point to the students who aren't participating, like this is not a uh, kind of an acceptable uh, way to participate in the class or lack of participation. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think there's some good advice, um, both in response to that scenario and then what folks wrote about crickets, you know, if you invite everyone in the class to take a moment to write down their thoughts first, then that can sometimes elicit more participation because some people um, just aren't as quick with the response, you know, but if you give them a moment to think about it, then more people may have a response. You might also come up with a system um, to like go row by row and, and just let students know, like today, I'm going to ask for responses from row number three and then row number four, you know, so it's not all on one person and you're not calling mm -hmm. it one person in particular, but just you're looking to different zones and you want people from different zones to be engaging in the discussion. And you might um, just have a private conversation with, with the uh, over participator and tell them, you know, straight up, you love their enthusiasm, you love their participation and you are looking to get more participation from the rest of the class. So, um, you know, ask them to like give you two responses per session or something, you know, you can be pretty, pretty straightforward and just say like, I need everybody to be getting their voice out there. So, um, you know, I'm probably gonna cut you off after two responses. Okay. That that's really helpful. <laughs> okay. Good. I've that also is a tough one. I've also just explicitly said, because I've definitely done the write out your answer. And then I'll just say, I want to hear from someone I haven't heard from today. Yeah. Um, because I usually tend to have like three that tend to be like the ones who always want who are very engaged. Um, so I just say, like, oh, who hasn't, you know, and let me know, or even like break them up into like five groups and you say, Okay, now someone report from group one yeah like that's another way i've tried to like mitigate is just explicitly saying i want to hear from a quiet student today absolutely i mean yeah, we've all been there I, too right sometimes what i do is if i'm having groups present i'll you know assign them different roles or i'll say somebody has to be the spokesperson for the group uh and it should be somebody who was not the spokesperson last time so i mean if you're thinking about participation and speaking in class as only 
within one session, you might it might help to think of it over how are students engaging in different ways that might not be explicitly speaking out in class, but then how are they also participating over a period of time? Because we all have days where we don't want to say anything. We want to participate with our camera off. You know, we want to be quiet because we have a headache. Um, but if that is, you know, just look at it over a longer period of time too. Okay, that's all very good information. I'm actively taking notes. <laughs> Great. Okay, so um, before we wrap up, we also just wanted to talk a little bit about some logistics. Um, for uh, for some of you, I mean, you you've already dealt with this if you're teaching right now this week. But um, to to deal with things like your syllabus, your schedule, your textbook, um, be in close contact with your department um, to find out about that stuff. In terms of office supplies, um, I truly hope that you don't have to buy all this stuff. So check in with your department about things like masks, dry erase markers, binder clips, index cards, that sort of thing that you need for the classroom. Um, same with copying and printing. And uh, we want to put out there as well that classroom technology and facilities support is available for those technology issues. So put these phone numbers in your phone and save them. Um, the help number is for the main IT desk, but when you are in the classroom and like the projector isn't working or um, the screen won't come down, something like that, you can call classroom support directly. Don't go through the IT desk like help line where you have to queue up and wait, but uh, go straight to classroom support. And um, are there other logistical questions where you're just like, where do I get this or where do I find that? Sorry, I was taking notes when you had mentioned the classroom technology. Um, mm -hmm. So you were saying that second phone number is the one where you don't get put on like hold. It's like the direct line. Yeah, that goes directly to the classroom support division of IT. So there's like big IT and then there's classroom support. And if you call directly to classroom support, um, they should be able to send somebody right over to your classroom sooner or like get you help like in the middle of class. So that's the number to call if you are in the classroom. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, and then just a reminder, you have, you know, you have support. Um, I am director of the faculty center. We're here to help instructors. So if you have uh, syllabus issues, assignment issues, if you want to talk something through, um, get in touch. You have the grad college to support you. Um, so we'll open it up for just like a couple minutes of Q&A. Anything else you want to talk about tonight? Caitlin's waving her arm, not because she has a question, because her lights went off again. <laughs> I guess I I don't know. I'm just thinking of questions. Um, but I I always I always feel like I fall back on like the same activities. Like, okay, writing and answer a question. Or, I don't know. Like I always feel like I fall back to these like safe safe activities. So I don't know if y'all have some like, for lack of a better term, some more like cutting edge. I don't, it's like seems like such a weird way to phrase it. Um, but just other activities, because I, I know that I used to be a very heavy lecturer. I'm trying now to do very heavy seminar is what I want to do. Like folks are sitting in a circle and groups of students are leading the seminar one one day a week because um, it's an upper division class, so it's smaller. Um, but if you just have any feedback of activities y'all have done. Um, I know it's also very broad because we're all in different disciplines. Um, well, that's the perfect teaser so. for next week, actually, Teresha. Oh, great. <laughs> next Friday, same time, same place, we're talking about active learning strategies and assessment. So basically like filling in that lesson plan template with some different activities. Some of them are definitely going to be reading and writing activities, but we'll add some variety in there too and are open to you all's ideas. So please. And I would also, you know, take some of the pressure off of yourself, you know, going back to that idea of backward design, you know, we're starting with what do we want our students to learn? And we don't necessarily have to have the most, you know, 
the, the sexiest, you know, most technology, like the most complicated activity in order for students to learn most of the time. Uh, you know, there are, you know, we have these kind of default activities in our class in our pockets because they also work for the majority of our students, regardless of if the technology is there, if the, the classroom lights turn on or not. And just to clarify, that's going to be recorded because, of course, next week I'm traveling for Labor Day weekend. Um, so we'll record and share again. It'll be awesome. recorded. We'll, have, um, we'll be adding our materials as well to that same uh, Google folder. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm sad I'm going to miss the live one of that one, but I'll make sure to watch it. All right, well, thank you all so much. It was a pleasure to meet you and we hope to see many of you again next week. Uh, I did just get a, a question about the resources for composition students of material that I put up. That's just an example of the kind of materials that I've made available for our English department. Uh, there's a lot of things that are generalizable as well. Um, and so you can take that and use it to create your own for your specific classes. Thank you so much, Melissa and Caitlin, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. And thanks to our participants for joining us. Um, just before you log off, uh, please go ahead and take a few minutes just to fill out the workshop feedback survey we dropped in the chat. We use these every semester to help us mm -hmm. come up with next semester's um, offerings. I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you all so much for coming. Bye.